Only when we have the ability to have the right emotions at the right time, at the right level, should we be leaning into our emotions. If we can't, we're emotionally immature. And this is where the emotional thing is so, such a, a, a trigger hot topic, because people are right. You should feel your emotions. You should process them. You should feel them fully so they can pass through you. That's what we want to have happen. Hello and welcome to another episode of Chasing Excellence. My name is Patrick Cummings. As always, I'm here with Ben Bergeron. Every week on the show, we dedicate some time to exploring how we can live a life of better health and increased fulfillment. We answer your questions about the five factors of health, dive deep into living a life of excellence, and explore the strategies and frameworks to help us chase what truly matters. Thank you so much for joining us this week. How are you, Ben? I'm doing really good, Patrick. Thanks. Excited. Good. I'm happy to hear it. Uh, this week, this episode, what we've got, we're addressing some questions about the most effective method for scaling a large number of push-ups, how to find the balance between losing body fat and building muscles, and seeking advice on setting boundaries and improving communication with our uh, with a mother-in-law. Our workout this week, we're going to talk about the concept of regulating emotions, exploring different ways we can take better ownership and control over them and why that matters. And then our cool down this week will be a segment from a longer conversation that I had recently with a friend of the show for some of the things we're doing inside of the premium membership. So do stay tuned for that. Speaking of, if you want a little bit more excellence chasing in your life, we'd love to have you jump into the premium membership uh, that we started recently that we've been talking about a bit. When you do, you'll receive ad-free episodes every week, as well as bonus content, including the chance to join our new book club. We are just wrapping up book number one, Patrick Lencioni's The Ideal Team Player. If you want to join us for book number two, sign up at www.chasingexcellence.email. You can get to that easily by clicking the link in the show notes to this episode. All right, my friend, the warm up. We start each episode with listener questions about the five factors of health, those few fundamental behaviors that most positively affect our performance, vitality, and longevity. Those five factors are how we eat, how we move, how we think, how we connect, and how we recover. This week, we've got three questions, one in the move category, one that sort of bridges between think and eat, and then our last will be in the connect bucket. First one is from Joe in the move category. He says, what's, a, what's the most effective method for scaling a large number of push-ups? Would it be better to be on the ground doing push-ups off my knees or set a bar up on the rig with my body at something like a 45 degree angle? Uh, yes, it would be the latter. So not a fan of the knee push-up whatsoever. Um, we've, we just did a workout today with sets of 30 push-ups. So this is something I talked to my class about. Um, as Joe says, setting up the uh, a bar in a rack to where your body's about a 45 degree angle is a great, great place to start. That's where we suggest or uh, hands on a box. So essentially the way I like to think of this is whether you're, you want to move yourself down. So whether that's starting doing pushups to a 30 inch box, basically your hands on the corner and bring your chest down and back up. But that's mimicking a real pushup. That's a, that's the real deal on your knees is not a real pushup. There's a weird thing that your body needs to do in a pushup. It's I'm not going to go into the the details of it, but being on your knees really negates it. It's not a, it's not a natural movement pattern. Um, being on a box works, and then you go from a box from a 30 inch to a 24 to a 20, and then the next thing we actually like to do, and here's the deal: is you know when to go to the next lower one when you can do three sets of 15. Take mm -hmm. a minute or two in between, but when you can do three sets of 15 go down to the lower one. What a lot of people do is they end up trying to go and do push-ups from the floor, but they're only able to do one, two, three, a handful of them. And that's essentially like doing constantly doing one, two, or three rep max bench presses. Like you need to get, and this is a body weight movement. This is supposed to be for strength endurance, not for strength. We do bench presses for strength. Strength is gained when you lift above 80%. We should be doing push-ups, as Joe says, at the higher rep ranges. If that's the case, we need to train at higher rep ranges. That's why we do three sets of 15. So here's the deal is use an elevated surface so you can do three sets of 15. Continue to lower that until you are basically as low as you can go with whatever implement you have. And then here's the weird thing coming from me especially is where I go then is not to, th not to the ground, but I would actually go to the ground with um, like a plate or an ab mm. mat underneath your chest. Something just to make that range of motion a little bit smaller. This is, yes, we're not talking about like the actual end stop place, but this is the way to progress to floor push-ups and then lower that a few times. So let me just 
this is a really in-depth answer, but let me just kind of give it real quickly. <laughs> Three sets of 15 to as high of an elevated target as you need. Is If that hands on a wall, is that hands on a 30-inch box, is that hands on a bench? Then from there, can you get 30, uh, sorry, three sets of 15 with that low elevated object? If you can, then start to work to um, regular push ups on the ground, not on your knees, with, uh, you know, two or three 10 pound plates underneath you. And then pull one. Mm-hmm. And then you get three sets of 15 there and then pull them out. And the reason for that is, again, this is a strength endurance movement not a maximal strength movement. So we need to train it in that fashion. I mean, you need to be doing sets of 15, not your one, twos, or threes, which everyone does. They just try to struggle through their their three to five on the floor, and we're not going to get better doing it that way. Take it. Okay. Next question is from James. I think he put this in the think category, and I'm jamming it a little bit into a think slash eat category question. Hmm. Cool. This is what he says. I'm 28, six foot three, 84 kilos or 185 pounds. Uh, with 22% body fat. I started CrossFit Inspired training about six months ago after a long period of solely rock climbing. In that time, I feel like I've improved my strength a lot, but not really my cardio or aerobic capacity. Despite being fairly skinny, my heart rate rises really quickly while training, and I continue to carry around or carry fat around my stomach. I feel like I should focus on cutting down my body fat percentage, but unsure how to do this without also losing muscle mass, which I desperately need. I switch constantly between thinking I need a a calorie deficit to cut body body fat and worrying I'm not getting enough food to build muscle and recover. Is it best to go through phases of building or uh, building and cutting, or is it possible to build muscle oh while God. lowering body fat? Or am I overthinking this early? Ooh, there, in we there we go. There we go. And I should Jeez. just focus on being curious and training five to six days a week, which is why he put oh. this in the think category. Now that I, remember. okay, Got <laughs> now it. I get all uh, the, the, the end of the question. As you're reading that, I'm like, there is like nine questions in here. <laughs> so the really quick answer is yes, James, you're overthinking it. Just go there, train and have fun. Okay. Now the next mm-hmm. part is there's a little bit of confusion on James's part. Um, lowering body fat is not necessarily going to do the heart rate thing that he wants to. There mm-hmm. are plenty of uh, really high level cyclists that are walking around at 18, 19% body fat. So it's not necessarily um, that issue. Now, Yes, if you were to get leaner, would it help? Of course. But there's other things going on in this question. The way you um, lose body fat without decreasing muscle mass, you can say it with me, everyone already knows the answer, is maintaining a certain level of protein. So mm. it's just you have to get you have to get at least like at least 0.7 grams of protein for every pound of body weight. For someone like James, who's 6'3", 185 pounds, and not as lean as he wants to be, which is already fairly lean, means you can't, you you're gonna be a, try you gotta be over a, a you gotta be over a one for one. So James is gonna look for 185 grams of protein a day, and that's how you you can be in a calorie deficit. You can be in mm-hmm. a calorie deficit, but still maintain your muscle mass if you are not sacrificing protein. Okay, we'll move on. This is going to be from Emily. It's in our connect bucket. I'm seeking some advice about communication and boundary setting with my mother-in-law. Three years ago, I reacted poorly to her talking to my husband's doctor without our permission. Ever since then, she's been careful about, uh, about being around me, trying to figure out my boundaries, but we have never had the conversation. I recently decided that I think we need to have a conversation about it strictly to communicate my perspective and to let her know I don't like when she does when she just does things without asking, that I felt that I felt like I could not be my husband's wife and that decisions were being made between my husband and her. Is this a mature way to handle things or am I imposing my perspective on her when she isn't asking for it? I'm afraid that this will backfire and she'll be defensive. I know from listening to your podcast that sometimes we have to have hard conversations. How do you handle this situation or how would you handle this situation? I want to build a relationship, uh, especially now that I have a daughter. Really cool question. Okay. Uh, First off, that's a weird doctor that's sharing information with the mom. Like that's yeah, there's, for there's, an adult. There's parts of that story that we're that not just getting. That just sounds really weird. <laughs> like you can just call up and be like, so, you know, so my, my adult my, son. Yeah, my 44-year-old son. You know, I'm just kind of curious what what should I know? Yep. yep. Isn't there like this? It's not the Hippocratic Oath, but what is it? There's HIPAA, which is HIPAA. like the, that's, what, that's what I was thinking. Uh, yeah. 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 So there's something going on there. We're not, we're not, we're not going to answer that question though. <laughs> this is such an easy, change doctors. <laughs> so easy. Chasing excellence. 
All right. Uh, here's this is I like this um, that there's an awareness of this and um, we're uh, we understand that sometimes we have to have hard conversations. But um, this is going to end. This is going to end horribly if we don't change some things. And she knows this ahead of time. Like, yep. Um, last time this happened, defensiveness, and I'm going into this conversation. I think her words were strictly to communicate my perspective. Mm-hmm. Is that her words? Yep. Strictly to communicate my perspective oh. and to let her know. Okay. Yeah. No, avoid at all costs. Like, do not do this. Do not have this conversation. Like, it is. Here's the deal is like, you have no trust with this person at all. Mm-hmm. There's so much awkwardness, even when you're not having these conversations because you've eroded trust the first time. You didn't yeah. do it tactfully then. You're not going to do it tactfully now. So then the question becomes, how do you do it tactfully? And we have to understand is um, human beings operate with two different minds. They operate with the prefrontal cortex, which is the logical brain, which is where you can go, which if if we didn't have the second side, you go and go, hey, I just want you to strictly understand the way that I'm coming at this from my perspective so that yep. you can operate more clearly. That's what you could just do that. But that's only um, a part of the human brain. The other part is the amygdala, which is the mm-hmm. lizard brain. And that is 100% based on emotions. And if that part gets triggered, there is no prefrontal cortex. There is no logic. And the really popular parable or analogy that explains this is there's a rider on an elephant. And the rider, the human, the rider knows what the task is. It knows that it needs to get from point A to point B. It has a lot of cognition. It's very smart and it can figure things out and do things. The elephant is the the amygdala, the emotional part of the brain. If the elephant is calm, the, the rider is in charge. He can pull on the reins and the elephant will steer in one direction. He could get the elephant to do tricks. He can get the elephant to um, um, go and um, take a drink, but not take a drink. He can go and the, the rider is in charge. If there is something that spooks the elephant, that rider has no control. The rider is just along for a ride. There mm-hmm. basically is no rider. It's just the elephant doing whatever the elephant needs to do whatever the elephant thinks it needs to do to survive. So this is what we, this is why when you have, it matters the way you start conversations in a mm-hmm. huge, huge way. If you go into a conversation, I mess this up. I mean, I know this from experience. If you go in and mess this up in the beginning, I messed this up twice in the last week. Like I was just going to say, I messed it up this week. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We had a, we had an employee that wasn't, uh, um, um, executing on the job that we were giving and um, phenomenal, amazing employee. We love, lo- we love her. Like she's awesome. We so badly want her on our team, but I didn't go in there and establish trust. I didn't go and say that. I went in and said, so we're thinking about changing some things up. And what happened, like she just like you could, she basically went into like protective mode. There was like a veil that came across her, a shield came up, and nothing else I said in the meeting mattered. It, it, yeah. it just like it was gone. So I had to like pull back and I had that meeting on a Friday, I think. And on Monday, I was like – over the weekend, I was like, hey, no, that didn't go very well. Um, didn't say that, but I knew it. I was like, hey. Yep. I just want to catch up on the conversation we had last Friday. Uh, now we have a little bit of space to breathe and come back. And we came back. I basically just like – we love you. Like you're awesome. Mm. Like you're you're such a valuable part of this team. Um, I think we can put you in such a better position to thrive. I think this will be better for you both um, emotionally, spiritually, financially. And I laid out the ways that you could she could triple her income literally overnight. And she said, she's like, why didn't you say this to me on Friday? I'm like, <laughs> I did. I said all these things, but I didn't start it the right way. Yeah. That's so and interesting. It's right. And literally, she didn't hear anything. She went told defensive. Yeah. So this is the way if you want to have hard conversations. Yes. 
have hard, but hard conversations are not trying to drill into the other person your perspective. Mm-hmm. That's going to make things worse. Mm-hmm. Like always, always. And this is why people are afraid of hard conversations because they go and they go, they don't work. They make things mm-hmm. worse, right? Because you spooked the elephant. And now instead of an elephant that you're just not psyched with, you got a dangerous animal in the room. That's worse. That, yeah, that you cannot control. Exactly. Yeah. I think one thing, maybe two things, but the first thing that popped out with Emily's question that you sort of, you hinted at, but you didn't say the word, but I think it's important to say the word, which is that if there's resentment anywhere, you need to solve the resentment before you can solve the problem. And if Emily goes in without having figured out how do I let go of what happened three years ago, and then especially as to oh. what, to your point, I start the conversation with that resentment in my back pocket, like mm. you owe me something, how dare you have done this? I, again, to your point, and I, I think you're spot on with how that starts, but I, like Emily or any of us when we're in that, like if that is the case and we're holding on, we're harboring resentment from things that happened in the past, we've got to figure out how to let that stuff go. Cause otherwise, cause even then we're not operating with the, with our, with our logical brain, <laughs> we're still, Absolutely. our amygdala is still Absolutely. rearing to go. Um, cause, cause all resentment is, is fear and regret and all these other things that live in the back of our head. So that's the first part of it. And then the second part of it, which is something I've just been thinking a lot about lately, which is in conversations, in these kinds of hard conversations, it's so easy to talk backwards in time. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're trying to address this problem and all we ever do is go backwards to the, to where the problem started. And because we become emotional, because we become triggered, because we stop listening, we never get back to the present and then therefore we never get into the future. And so just remembering how important it is to center the conversation, not, I mean, of course, like address what happened in the past, but that's not the point. The point is to, to Emily's point or her, what she's aiming for is how do I have this conversation going forward? And so she has to be really careful to not live in the past so that she can actually bring the conversation into the future. Cause that though, that's where all the solutions are. Oh, I love that so much. Absolutely. It really comes down to like, as you, what you were saying though, is like, what is the real motive? Like, what is the real reason that you want to have the hard conversation? Is it because you want to like some, you want to feel justified. You want mm-hmm. to like someone to understand your perspective. Like, no, that's not the resolution. The resolution is, you guys have a really good, meaningful, happy relationship. That's yeah. what, like going forward. It's not she needs. I need, she needs to understand uh, how this hurt me in the past. That's mm-hmm. not. It's all about. I love that. Um, yeah, and you got to let go before you move on. Yeah, you cannot bring that to the table. Yep, it's really good. Cool. I think this is going to bleed into a little bit of one of our, our workout this week. Um, maybe it feels like we're, we're talking around the edges yeah. of that. So we're gonna be back in just a minute with that conversation. We're going to talk about some of the strategies that we can all implement to kind of regulate uh, our emotions. But first, a quick word of thanks from a few sponsors. We are brought to you this week by a new sponsor, Bond Charge. Bond Charge is creating science-backed wellness products to help optimize your sleep, well-being, and recovery. Head to bondcharge.com and use the code excellence to save 15% off your order, plus get free shipping. When you head to the website, I recommend you start by looking at the Bond Charge Infrared Sauna Blanket. This is a product that I had no idea even existed. It is a sauna that is also a blanket aptly named. It's super easy to use, easy to store away. And one of my new favorite ways to wind down after a hard day of podcasting, you know how hard this has been. The Bond Charge Infrared Sauna Blanket can be used at temperatures between 77 degrees up to 176 degrees Fahrenheit. And it takes just a few minutes to heat up. In my experience, it takes exactly as long to warm up as I need to find something to watch on Netflix. If you want to get all the benefits of consistent sauna exposure, Without the need for all that extra space and expense, check out the Bond Charge Infrared Sauna Blanket. Head to bondcharge.com. That's B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E. Use the code excellence for 15% off, free shipping, and a 12-month warranty. Start reaping the benefits of infrared sauna from the comfort of your home with Bond Charge. We're also brought to you this week by Momentus. We all know how crucial a good night's sleep is for our health and wellness, but let's face it, getting a restful night of sleep can be a challenge. That's where Momentous Sleep comes in. 
Learn more and get yourself some at livemomentous.com. Use the code excellence to save yourself 20% off your purchase. Momentous Sleep is a combination of three potent ingredients, magnesium L-threonate, apigenin, and L-theanine. Uh, each help you fall asleep faster, stay asleep longer, and wake up fully recharged. Each ingredient plays an important role in your sleep. Magnesium l is a naturally occurring micronutrient that passes through the blood-brain barrier more easily than other forms of magnesium, delivers calm and quiet straight to your brain. Apigenin calms the neurons in your forebrain, helping you enter a more restful state. And L-theanine, a natural amino acid found in tea, stimulates alpha brain waves associated with relaxation. Momentous Sleep comes in easy-to-use individual packets for maximized convenience. You can trust Momentous because of their unparalleled commitment to rigorous third-party testing and independent certification. So if you want to enhance your nighttime relaxation and sleep quality without daytime drowsiness, give Momentous Sleep a try. Just go to livemomentous.com, use the code excellence for 20% off sleep and all their best-in-class products. Our workout this week is something that you... You teased, I feel like you teased it in two different episodes, <laughs> but I made a note, something around regulating emotions. And one of the things I think you were saying when you brought that up was that we've kind of been led to believe that we don't have control over our emotions, that they're this kind of like this tidal wave that shows up and then essentially or effectively uh, recedes. And then when it recedes, we're kind of back to normal. And so we're trying to, we started to hint around this a little bit with some questions in our um our, our warm up there, but I'd love to first just kind of get you to kind of lay the context for us when we're talking about regulating emotions and, uh, and asserting some control over them. What are, what do we mean? What are we talking about? It's funny how, and I use this word kind of on, on purpose mate, but it's, it's funny how triggering emotions are, mm. right? It's very <laughs> like, yep. Like if you, if you say the wrong thing about emotions, you're like, watch out, you're going to get canceled. Like, no, emotions are like, no, it's, you, we have to experience our emotions and like process them fully. And it's mm-hmm. about, um, you know, um, we have to like embrace it's yes. We, like emotions are incredibly valuable tools that we have been given. Emotions are built into us as a part of the survival mechanism. That's why they are there. So we have to recognize what they're for, but also just like a lot of things, understand, are they continuing to serve us Mm. in this modern society or are we just going along for the ride of that are prehistoric ancestors were 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 programmed for that aren't a part of our modern day lives so to me it's not about are their emotions good or bad it's about do we have a certain level of emotional maturity and are the emotions that we're feeling lining up with our values that's really what it comes down to because if the emotions we're feeling aren't lining up with our values then they're 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 not serving us. So I think that and this is taken from a really terrific book called Designing the Mind. Um, I, I don't think it has an author, honestly. It's by like a group of people or like a company called like Psychotecture or something like that, which is basically like Psychotech, Design the Mind. You're like you can build this thing. It, you are not just put into this roller coaster that you're along for a ride. The analogy that they use, which is really popular, is you know a human operating system in the software. And you can upgrade your software, which is what we should all be trying to do constantly. Mm-hmm. Their um, framework for this, and I hope I'm not butchering this too bad, but uh, essentially their qualifier designation for emotional maturity is which by the way emotional immaturity is like this happens and you just feel it and people are like well if you feel that just feel it that's what you're supposed to do and mm-hmm. process it and go through it and feel it till it's fully out of you well yes as long as it's the right emotion at the right time at the right level mm. and this is what the, the, everyone's missing. I should want to say everyone on people saying that just like, just feel and process emotions. Just go. Th- 
yes, yes. An example of that would be if you if you lose a loved one. Gosh, I hope you feel emotion. Like that would be so weird as a human being not to feel emotion when you lose someone close to you. But is it the right emotion? If you feel despair, you're essentially throwing your hands up and going, my life is over and I have no, like that is not the right emotion. And Brene Brown does a phenomenal job of like labeling and the ability to have a vocabulary to be able to express truly what you're feeling, not just default to sad, right? Mm -hmm. Because you might be feeling grief and despair versus grief, both in the, in the bucket of sad are completely different things. Despair is I, my life is over. I can't go on. And how many people, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows somebody in their lives that has lost someone close to them and basically their life ended. Mm -hmm. Whether it was like you lo you lost a child and now it's like this total despair of like, what is this world all about? Like, how could this happen to me? Like, why go forward? Like, as opposed to grief, which is grief is I loved that person so much. I loved, that was such an incredible part of my life. Am I sad that's over? Yes. But how lucky am I to have experienced that level of connection, love, whatever it might be, that relationship? It is so different. And we have to understand that it is a fundamentally different thing. One is there is no hope. The other is the opposite. The other is love and it gives meaning to life. They're the, mm -hmm. they're, they're polar opposites. So we have to make sure we're experiencing the right feeling. The next one is the right time. So let's say um, you or someone you know was the unfortunate victim of some sort of childhood abuse. When that's happening, I hope that the child that that's happening to feels anger. That's, that's a good thing that's going to, that's going to fuel the survival mechanism. Anger. Do not get close to this person. Uh, or sorry, let's say a different one instead of anger. Let's use hate. I hate that person. I hate that person for doing this to me. Good. Don't get close to people like that. That is a really useful emotion to have. When that person comes by, I hate that person. I don't want to be near that person. Really good. If you still hate the person that did something to you when you're you were seven, when you're 57, you're not moving on. Like we we the only time that you get to move on, you can't hold on to hate forever. That's not what we're supposed to do. Holding on to hate is like holding on to a hot coal and hoping that the other person feels the pain. You're not. You are just putting yourself in a constant state of fight or flight. You have switched into the sympathetic nervous system and you are killing yourself. Literally, your arteries are closing up and you are in a stressed, stressed induced, suppressed immune system. This is, we, this is not what hate was built for. It was not built to hold and harbinger for decades and decades and decades. You're not doing it for the right amount of time. Mm. let's take the third one which is to the right degree if you're a hockey dad and you're at your 11 year old kids hockey game and another kid takes a run takes a cheap shot at your kid comes across the ice and just like whacks him with the stick across the head and your kid goes down that's the I, I, if you don't feel anger at that point you are not a parent like you should feel anger. That means that you are protective. That means that you um, want to keep your kid from getting harmed. That means that you um, are ready to take action when things like that happen. Okay, but that should dissipate and it should be a low level of anger to the point where you might get pissed off, right? But maybe after like, what was that? it kind of mellows out a little bit or does it escalate to where you are then pointing at the parent of the other kid yelling at that parent and then it spills out into the parking lot 
and now you're having a fist fight afterwards. That's not the right level of anger. We can't control it. That's emotional immaturity. Mm. Only when we have the right, the ability to have the right emotions at the right time, at the right level, should we be leaning into our emotions. But other than that, if we can't, we're emotionally immature. And this is where the emotional thing is so such a, a, a trigger hot topic because people are right. You should, you should feel your emotions. You should process them. You should feel them fully so they can pass through you. That's what we want to have happen. Just like Emily in the previous one about her going in mm-hmm. with what was it? resentment is the word you used. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Mm-hmm. If you find out that your mother-in-law is going behind your back to uh, find things out from your husband's doctor that you didn't even know about at the time, there should be a little bit of level of resentment there. But, oh my God, are we holding on to that resentment for months and years? Are we feeling it at such a level that it's destroying the relationship and now it's maybe affecting even your relationship with your husband? Like that, no, 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 no. You feel it and you go, hmm, you figure out how to process that. Is it the right emotion? Am I feeling it's the right amount? Am I feeling it's at the right time? And if we're able to do that, then yes, emotions can so serve us. They can serve us so well, particularly if you can tie it back to what is the evolutionary biological uh, mechanism that is being worked here? Mm. Fear has a real place in the human in the in the human system it keeps you alive Mm -hmm. that idea of um um anger it it can keep you alive all emotions are they are there to signal things that you want to keep doing and signal things that you should stay away from that's what this whole thing is from so the whole we've talked about this before but there is a algorithm to this which is there is a trigger Something happens. Your kid gets whacked on the ice. Someone you love dies. You're abused. Your 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 mother-in-law does X, Y, and Z. Something happens. After something happens, there is a thought. That thought for most of us is pre-programmed. I mean, it happens subconsciously, meaning that you don't think you have control over it. We're going to come back to that. That thought then Uh, It creates an emotion. It creates anger. It creates frustration. It creates fear. It creates jealousy. It creates um, joy. It creates bliss. It creates whatever it is, which leads to a physiological thing. Anything from switching from the parasympathetic nervous system or vice versa. Maybe it finds you in a flow state where you're um, blood is flowing through and your prefront, your, your brain waves are firing in this um, certain wave pattern. There's a physiological state, uh, shortness of breath, tightness of chest, dials pupillating, sweat. There's like, that's how we get to those physiological states. The thing to recognize is that the thought, yes, if we're not conscious, and this is where we are different. We are conscious beings, but if you are not conscious, you think you have no control over this. You do. Mm -hmm. It's all pre-programmed into us though. If I grew up and both my parents were allergic to bees, I grew up with a certain belief system about bees. Like if one is in the house, time to freak the F out. Like this is all hands on deck, panic mode, anxiety, Mm -hmm. everyone's screaming, all the rest. Heather, my wife, she grew up and both of her parents were bee farmers. They thought bees were the thing that made the the world go round. Without the bees, they're the most magical beings on planet Earth from the the hives to the way they protect the queen to the way they pollinate to the way they can make the world go. And they had bees and they they were like a cherished animal in, uh, in, in their youth. If we're at the beach one day and a bee lands on my arm and a bee lands on Heather's arm, The trigger, the thing that happened is the exact same. What happens is there's a subconscious thought that I have, and there's a subconscious thought that Heather has. Those are completely divergent, which leads us into completely different emotional and physiological states. I think, oh my God, and I freak out. I have, I fear comes shooting up. 
I go into fight or flight mode. I am ripped into the sympathetic nervous system and all the blood leaves my gut, goes to my extremities. My pupils dilate, sweat starts to come out. I get shortness of breath. And then all of a sudden I start to hyperventilate. I go into full panic mode. Whereas Heather goes, ooh, ooh. (laughs) Well, if we can recognize that those things are just programming, it's just programming, they're not real, then we can start to rewire emotions. We can start to re- we can start to take control of them. Meaning, um, there is a phone call. We've used this example before. You get a phone call mm-hmm. or a text message um, from your boss on Saturday night saying, "Hey, first thing Monday morning, can we chat?" If you've grown up with this idea of like things are going to be terrible. Um, oh my gosh, I'm not good enough. I'm super insecure. Imposter syndrome. I don't have this. Uh, my No one likes me. When you get that text message, I know what the default subconscious thought patterns are, which are going to lead to what for the next 24 to 36 hours. Mm-hmm. If you grew up with a, um, I love getting feedback and I love hearing from superiors and I love being coached and man, every time that they tell me something that I can work on, I feel like I'm getting better, which is there, there are people like this. There are people like this. I was just at my, um, my daughter's lacrosse game, uh, lacrosse practice in one of these huge multi-sport complexes. And there's this really high level basketball team practicing there. And the feedback that these players were getting from the coaches was incredible. Like you, people were stopping and watching this practice because it was, mm. so, I mean, it's just like, it was just coaches. T- they're doing like walkthroughs. They're like grabbing a player by the shoulders. Be like, no, when he goes here, you need to go here. And you're like, move him physically, like four steps over and grab another guy and be like, and you got to rotate this way. But it was being done so at such a high level that people were stopping just to like absorb knowledge being passed. And these Mm -hmm. players got to where they are because they were so excited for, tell me what I'm doing wrong. That's, I want to know, like, I want to know what it is that I can do to become better. Don't tell me what I'm doing right. The reason I'm here is because, well, there are people that take take on jobs like that. They take on jobs that like, I want to grow. I'm the learner. I want to improve. Yeah, like, okay, like I did great in that meeting. Yes, you, you thought I did that project really well. Okay, tell me something I can work on. What should I get better at? There are people like that. And it's not just built into you. This is plastic. You can, it's moldable. You can work on this, which means emotions aren't set. Which means when your boss says, hey, we got to talk first thing Monday morning, or boss says, hey, you're not meeting expectations, it doesn't mean you have to feel angst or anxiety or upset. You don't need to feel those things. Now, it's not easy to change it. But if you've been sitting on a couch for 15 years, eating Cheetos and watching Netflix, and you want to change your body, That takes a lot of work, a lot of work. If you haven't done anything to change your emotional maturity, same deal. It Mm -hmm. takes a lot of work. But we got to start with the recognition that it is something you can change. The fact that you are 300 pounds overweight has to do with your lifestyle and decisions. The reason that you are rattled by things outside of you is because you have yet to work on the emotional maturity level. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but first I want to clarify. The the book you mentioned at the the top, uh, Designing the Mind, The Principles of Psychotecture. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's if you just search that, the principles of psychotecture, not a word I've ever heard. P-S-Y-C-H-I-T-E-C-T-U-R-E. 90% certain they made it up. (laughs) Well, that's good. Good on them. Okay. So I just wanted to put that out there for folks if they put a little pin in that like I did. Um, This feels like an interesting extension of a conversation we had recently about the awareness, intention, action framework. This feels to me like the deepest dive we've done on the awareness element of that. Because in in so many cases, the thing we need to be aware of 
is what happens when trigger, right? What happens inside of me when that thing happens, when I get the text message, when my wife says the thing, when I need to talk to my mother-in-law, whatever it might be, the awareness is what's happening inside of me, which is another way to say, what is the emotion that I'm feeling and what am I going to do with that emotion? And so I just want to put that out there and just to ask the question, which is the, the result of beginning to understand this ownership we can take over our emotions is the is the result of that the the benefit of that the point of all of that such that we have the awareness we need to then make the intention in the direction to your i think your words in the direction of our values and not away from our values and therefore of course then put that into action is that really like that's the ball game once we do this we have that and we can then go forward there's a reason that when we talk about first principles in the think category, our first principle is be curious, not judgmental. Mm-hmm. That is not, well, it's not not, but um, it is not necessarily like um, don't judge the other politi- side of the political spectrum. Mm-hmm. Don't judge mm-hmm. people yeah. for uh, the way they're treating their kid at a, at a park. Don't um it's not about judging other it's not that's not where this starts when we say be curious not judgmental it's not about judging other people it's about being curious as you said just said why am i feeling that emotion that's mm-hmm. where it starts what caused that why mm-hmm. do i feel like that and then with that level of awareness yes then you can start to unwind things as you would say that's how you start to that's when you start to unpack things Right. <laughs> that's right. So yes, that is where that's where the whole thing starts is that level of awareness. Awareness takes so many things, right? It's like, what do I want out of my life? Um, um, awareness of how am I living in accordance with my values? Well, this is the big part of living in accordance with am, am I aware of when my emotions are derailing me and not serving me? Because emotions should ser- should serve you. Mm-hmm. They should signal things to you. If you're having negative, uncontrollable emotions, we're not moving forward with these things. And the emotions are there to serve you. Although you can be the master of your emotions, right? Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying like, recognize this. I'm not saying when somebody dies, you don't get sad. Mm -hmm. That's not the thing at all. You're supposed to be sad. That serves you. That's a process for losing someone you loved. You're supposed to grieve. That's great. But that's very different than going back and like regret or despair, different emotions. So yeah, it, it, it starts with that awareness intention that leads to action. And that's why we, we kept, keep going back and keep going back to where it's the same thing as the AA thing. It's like awareness is 26 miles of the marathon. You still got... Point two to go, but awareness is the is the jam. Awareness is the deal, because without it, you're just a a, a a a ship afloat in the sea, being blown in any direction that the the wind wants to blow you. You have no rudder, you have no oars, you have no steering wheel. You're just aimlessly adrift, based off of the pre programming of your ancestors. Like we are conscious beings. This is the, which separates us from the animals. Animals can't do that. Animals can't go, hmm, why did I think that thought? They can't think mm-hmm. thoughts about their thoughts. <laughs> they can't question their emotions. We are allowed to do this. This is what separates us from the animals. That and opposable thumbs. <laughs> last question I have, or last, I, last uh, point of conversation, which is, I'm curious your thoughts about the emotion of anger and a little bit of context. I have a friend who she and I have, have jokingly fought about the value of anger. And she, she thinks about it in the, in the context of like, as a mother, as a parent, like sometimes your kids are just going to make you angry and that's okay. And what I always try to argue with her is like, if you get to the point of anger, if you get to the point of yelling, if you get to the point of like maximum frustration, you've already lost (laughs) because getting to the point of anger, and this isn't just a parenting, that just happens to be the context that she and I talk about it in. But if you're getting angry at traffic, if you're getting angry at your kids 
coach for not putting him into the game in the third inning, if you're getting angry at the other kid's parent because the kid pushed your kid, whatever. To me, and I'd love your thoughts on it, like you're already like two miles too far down the road of emotions because anger is never anything except a misapplication of emotions. I'd love your thoughts on that because you started this with the with like feel your emotions and if you're angry, be angry and et cetera. But I love this one in particular, anger in particular is a very interesting one to me No, because I almost yeah. never see the point of it. I never see the benefit of it that couldn't have been found in a much more productive way. It's, um, this is, a uh, um, so your friend and I, I, I kind of hope she's listening. Um, this is an emotional immaturity. It's not that she should be feeling anger. This is a, we don't have the emotional vocabulary. She should be feeling frustration. Mm -hmm. Frustration. You want something to happen and it's not happening. So you should get frustrated with that. This is Brene Brown's thing is um, the, the average human being can only name three emotions. Happy, mm. happy, sad, and angry. That's it. Mm. Interesting. So yeah. they bucket everything into one of those three things and they feel frustration, but they don't recognize it as frustration. So it manifests as anger. Because they go, oh, I'm feeling that thing. Rah! Yep. I know how to be angry. Or I'm feeling yep. that thing, so I know how to be sad. Like, it's, no, it's, we have to understand, this is the emotional maturity. This is what we're talking about. This is the right emotion. If your kids are making you angry, no, that's not what this, angry is for, is for like, what I said. It's the, someone attacks somebody that you know, and you should get angry because you're already going to go and, Protect them if needed, right? Then we talk about the right level, right? So, no, she's missing the mark. Mm. Fascinating. I'm a friend. We're going to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you very much for that. That's fun. I'm glad we got that in after your little toss away comment on it. Um, we're going to be back in a minute with a new shout out and a cool down. But first, another quick word of thanks from a few sponsors. We're brought to you this week by Hatch. Do you ever find it challenging to get to bed on time? Do you find yourself spending your last waking minutes scrolling on your phone only to get to sleep later than you should, only to wake up groggy and grumpy, only to need a bucket of coffee to feel human in the morning? Well, then you ought to check out the Hatch Restore. Go to hatch.co slash excellence to see this pretty little device that will help you unwind, get to sleep, and wake up more useful, as well as my own current mission, which is to make going to bed so enticing that no number of cat videos will keep me up later than I ought to be. Do you watch cat videos? Sometimes. Don't judge me. Do you really? Don't judge me. Sometimes. I'm not. I'm super cats, curious. I'm a, I'm a cat. You're, you have two cats? cats? Yeah. We just got a new one. We just got a kitten. Really? Got a kitten. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Don't, uh, don't, with the hat restore, don't judge me. <laughs> with the hat restore, I can create a personalized sleep routine choosing the light, sound, and settings that work best for me. And so can you. I've also unlocked the Hatch Plus subscription, which gives me access to premium routine building features like Pillow Talk, an audio series designed to help you get to sleep without disruptive screens. The other night, I listened to a story about the history of flagpole sitting which, you know, succeeded in making me tired. Do you know what flagpole sitting is? I ben? don't. I've never heard of that. It's apparent, it's, I don't think is it what it sounds like? Or, it's exactly what it sounds like. People just got to the top of a flagpole and sat there. Uh, and they did it for like weeks. Anyways, I what? learned quite a bit and then fell asleep. Uh, Hatch is offering our listeners $20 off your purchase of the Hatch Restore and free shipping. Head to hatch.co slash excellence to get this exclusive offer. Again, hatch.co slash excellence for $20 off and free shipping. Take control of your nighttime routine with Hatch. We're also brought to you by Element. Are you feeling tired and drained during your workouts? Or maybe you're experiencing headaches and muscle cramps. These could be signs of an electrolyte imbalance. Element to the rescue. Head to drinkelement.com slash excellence to learn more about the zero sugar electrolyte drink mix that has everything you need to stay energized and hydrated. Founded by former research biochemist and author Rob Wolf and Keto Gains founder Louis Villasenor, Element offers a powerful blend of sodium, potassium, and magnesium, essential electrolytes that help maintain balance, especially during intense physical activities. Plus, it doesn't contain any sugar, artificial colors, or other dodgy ingredients. Don't just take our word for it, though. Element is trusted by many of the world's leading health experts and athletes. It's the exclusive hydration partner of Team USA Weightlifting and is also consumed by professional sports teams across the NFL, NBA, and even the Navy SEALs. 
with flavors like citrus salt, raspberry salt, and even a spicy mango chili. There's definitely an element flavor for you. So don't let electrolyte imbalance hold you back. Give Element a try and see the difference it makes. Just for our listeners, Element is offering a free sample pack with any purchase. Head to drink Element. That's L M N T dot com slash excellence to claim this offer. Remember, hydration isn't just about water, it's about water and electrolytes. Try Element today. We have a shout out from Dale. Shout out is just when we take a moment to share a word from one of our listeners, a note that they sent us, sometimes a review on Apple Podcasts. This is from Dale. A while back, you read a listener comment from someone who likely isn't a parent who uh, was a little nonplussed by a conversation about parenting, family, relationships, etc. As a guy who... As a guy who is a few years ahead of you both in life, I wanted to share I think you're doing what you're doing is fantastic and I wish I had found ways to infuse more of this into my life when my kids were younger. It's wonderful to hear you modeling thoughtful approaches to life in relationships with others whether it takes the form of a parent, spouse, friend, adult child to older parent, etc. We have too little of this particularly these days when it is so easy to disconnect from our families and communities. Whether that disconnection is caused by physical distance, emotional distance, technological distance, or other such reasons, these disconnections can make it harder for us to live lives where it's easy to witness, uh, where it's easy to witness and follow good examples of healthy relationships. Your comments were right on the mark. This matters. Chase it or kiss mm. it goodbye. Your choice. It's great that you two are planting seeds of thought that might take years to blossom. Thanks to you, the listener who wrote in and likely others is encountering new ideas that might help him in unexpected ways at unexpected times. The same goes for me. I never know when one of the things I learned from listening to you will spring forth. That's awesome. That's a great note from Wow. Dale. Thank you. Dale. Yeah. All right. That's cool really down. cool. Yeah, it is very cool. Our cool down. Uh, this is going to be a little segment of a conversation that I had recently with a mutual friend of ours, uh, Ben. His name is Jameson. He runs a gym in Tennessee called CrossFit Elysium. He is also the head of Comtrain Gym. So not only is he a friend, but he's also now a colleague. Uh, and he's an incredibly good human. Yes. Um, and one of the things that he's doing down at CrossFit Elysium, one, he's been listening to the show a long time. It's kind of how he got to us, how he found us, how we re- originally reached out to us. One of the things he's doing there with his coaching staff is he's creating, sort of actively creating this idea of the five factors method coaching. That will sound familiar to a lot of folks. Um, uh, where he works with his athletes in the gym across the five factors of health. And so because he's a friend, because I know I've gotten a we've gotten a good sense of what he's doing there, I wanted to bring his voice into this conversation a little bit. And so this, what we're gonna listen to now is a segment of a longer conversation that if you are a premium member of uh, of the podcast, you can get the full thing as well as uh, a handful of more conversations that he and I are going to have around these ideas, around this practice, around this program that he's put in there in his gym. Um, and again, the, the conversation that we had was a little bit of context, a little bit of getting a sense of how he's doing it, why he's doing it, what he's thinking about as he's building this program at the gym. So this is a little bit of a segment and we'll be back at the end of it. What I'm really curious about is something that you're doing there, which is, you know, maybe a a two or three step process to get somebody into that coaching, you know, relationship, let's put it. And one of the things that you're doing is, or you're just kind of identifying like, what is the actual like problem here? And then what is the process by which we can kind of unwind that problem? Can you just talk to me a little bit about what you've been able to identify as like, okay, this is the problem and here's how we begin to fix it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, obviously, we've we've talked even in the last months about like our uh, exorbitant amount of frameworks that we use for things <laughs> and structures. I don't, I, don't even, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and the one that makes a ton of sense to me that um, we use in lots of formats is the problem process power. Of, I mean, you can say it a ton of different ways. I think that um, it's really grabbing people and focusing them f- focusing them in on identifying their present reality and their preferred future and then the difference between those things because mm-hmm. that's really all that's really all the coaching is uh is your ability to get people from point a to point b and if Closing you're a good coach yeah you just close the gap and likely if you are if you are a good coach and rather than coaching a thing you're coaching a person you help them realize that what they were aiming at is likely not the end state or the end goal anyways. Uh, and mm-hmm. so 
I think it is in walking people through that gap or through that difference of your present and your preference that you begin to help people really discover like why they set out on the journey in the first place. And so as a coach, you may be like, yeah, for sure. I know that that's what you think you want. And I'm on board because I know what you're going to discover is what you actually want along the way. Um, and ultimately like it's beginning with the end in mind, but also determining what are the obstacles and blockers that are currently in place to keep you from moving toward that end. And so this problem process power framework, I think is really powerful because it, like you, like you've already said, like it brings things down from the cloud and puts it on the ground for people. It lets them go like, Mm -hmm. okay, um, I'm recognizing the problem I'm currently existing in. I'm going to be uh, given the tools necessary, which is the process to take action and then um, discover kind of the power that I have in order to to actually take that action and move away from the problem and more towards my preference. Um, and so I think it's I think it's maybe an oversimplification the way we've defined the problem. Um, but I would say <clears throat> that in personal experience and in conversations with a lot of people, um, we have defined the five factor problem uh, or the problem that the five factor method addresses as like human paralysis. Um, the, the problem being paralysis is this experience, not a feeling, but like a true experience where people are just like straight up stuck. Uh, they are spinning their wheels. Like there's no like downward vertical force in order for them to gain any traction to move forward. Um, and they're just very stuck, um, in our kind of onboarding for the five factor method, we talk about this paralysis problem and go, Hey, there are, there are a lot of forms in which paralysis presents itself in people's lives. Um, and we've got a list and that list can include things just like a, a general sense of overwhelm can be really, um, paralyzing, um, this kind of sense of disorientation or confusion where there's not like a real coherence that you're living your life with. Like, you're kind of just stumbling and you can't tie a sense of clarity to anything. Um, trauma is certainly one of those things that's very paralyzing for people. Um, instability, uh, you know, getting into things like apathy and ignorance, um, mindset issues like the victim mentality or entitlement relationship or connection issues like isolation, um, you know, lack of community, lack of support, lack of friendship, Um, and I mean, I I think you can dig deep enough in it to go like, there are even things at play here that are like generationally cyclical that Mm -hmm. cause you to feel paralyzed and stuck. Um, and so ultimately I think people face these optical obstacles with no process or power to address them. And so they're just paralyzed. They're just stuck. Um, you know, and again, I think it is maybe it, it may be oversimplified or clumsy language to describe it. I think it's one way to describe it. I think it's, it, yeah, I think it's a way to describe the current human condition, at least in our kind of culture and society where people are very, very um, stuck. And uh, I would say even to an, to an extent like purposeless mm-hmm. in things um, to where there's just a lot of stumbling through. There's a lot of existing and not thriving. Um, and so there's a lot of things that keep stuck people stuck. And so we want to go, let's identify what's making you stuck and then use the process and power to get out of that. Um, and that feels to be the language that's most effective. Yeah. What's interesting about that is because we, when we think about problems, there's really always, there's, there's usually two levels of problems, right? There's the problems we're willing to say out loud, uh, or the, even the mm-hmm. ones that we're willing to say to, to ourselves and the actual problem. And those two things right. aren't always the same thing. And it's, it's in and of itself, another sort of uh, gap that we need to close, right? Because what you listed, right, whether it's overwhelm or, you know, uh, uh, trauma or isolation, any of these things, those are like what we could call like second level problems. Symptoms, yeah. Yeah, and the first level is, well, I'm I'm overweight or I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm sick all the time or I'm tired or I've got three kids or like, right? Like the things that as I'm, as I meet you, I'm like, yeah, I'm willing, I'm willing to tell you these things. Like I'm willing to tell you these are my problems. Yeah. How often is it that that's what you're presented with when somebody sits down with you and says like, okay, tell me more about this. Oh, okay. My problem. Well, my problem is I don't have enough time. My problem is 
fill in the blank, right? My, my problem is, uh, you know, yeah. my mother was like this and this is why I right? like all of those things. How often is it like, that's what you're presented with. And actually through the process is the identification or the more accurate identification of, oh, okay, this might really be my problem. My, my, my problem might be that I have this victim mentality or some, something else. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the process uh, by which you <clears throat> guide people to take responsibility for themselves um, I, is a difficult, uh, narrow, and hard road to walk. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, as a as a direct answer, like that's almost always the case. Where when you sit with people and you begin to talk about blockers or obstacles or problems. Um, you know, it, it's a small sampling rate. So I'm not saying the entire world would do this, but it, it's a a hundred percent, um, in, in terms of the results of people who sit with you and identify, uh, their obstacles, barriers, and issues as circumstances, other things, or other people. So there's a, there is a, there's very much a, uh, an external or an extrinsic, like otherness to our problems in which, Paralysis really occurs um, because of the fact that you are giving your own power away to things that are paralyzing you. Um, And so it's a really hard conversation to lead with. And most people are not primed and in a position to have that conversation immediately where you're like, oh, here's your problem. Um, you got to take responsibility for yourself. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. that's typically not uh, the most effective way to lead as a coach um, and not even seen as like kindness, even though you intend it to be, um, unless you have that really well-established relationship and that trust there, like you can't really lead with that. Thank you, Jameson. Uh, Again, if you want to hear that full conversation as well as a few more that he and I are having, uh, we welcome you. We invite you to join the premium membership. You can do so at www.chasingexcellence.email, which you can get to easily by clicking the link in the show notes. We, uh, we invite you there. We thank you for checking, for checking it out. Thank you again to Jamerson for that chat. Ben, thanks to you. Thanks everybody out there for listening. We'll be back next week for a new episode of Chasing Excellence.